Well, hello, everyone. I might say good morning or good afternoon, depending where you are listening to us from. Welcome to the third day in the Newfoundland Gold Virtual Investor Days series. I'm so glad that you could join us. Uh, and I'm very excited to be hosting uh, today's panel discussion and then introducing a keynote speaker that I know we are all here on the panel interested to hear from. So without further ado, let's kick off. I am joined today by the president, CEOs, leaders, of four different Newfoundland gold explorers. I'm gonna start by giving each of them just three minutes, very short time frame, to introduce themselves and, and their company in obviously very brief um, so that we can set the stage. And then I have a bunch of questions that I'm going to ask them, uh, mostly around sort of geology and how this incredible Newfoundland area play is developing. So. Let me start with the company that put out um, some news that caught a little bit of attention this morning. That would be Labrador Gold. And Roger Moss is here to uh, give us a brief int introduction to that story. Yeah, thanks, Gwen. And thanks, uh, thanks everybody, for, uh, for attending and for the Newfoundland Gold Alliance for putting this all together. Um, yeah, I'm, a, I'm an expor exploration geologist. I've had something like 30 years of experience in mineral exploration, mostly copper and gold, and uh, all over the world, a lot of it in Canada. And uh, Labrador Gold really came together about three years ago when we optioned some shares from, uh, optioned the property from Sean Ryan. And uh, Sean and I have been working together ever since. Uh, we optioned the Kingsway project from him last year. And uh, <clears throat> that was that was an interesting story. It was right after the discovery announced by Newfound Gold Corp. And um, it was really, uh, at, well, we all know what happened with that intersection. And uh, I said about trying to find something nearby. And Sean happened to mention that he had these claims right next to them. So uh, we got into a bit of a bidding war for them. We won it. And then we did a lot of exploration last year. We, we hit the ground running after getting through all the COVID regulations. And uh, we spent about four months on the ground and uh, ended up with a, with a discovery of visible gold in a quartz vein boulder right next to a quartz vein outcrop, which we now call Big Vein. And um, yeah, the results that we put out this morning uh, from the drilling that we've been doing on that, uh, on that Big Vein. And uh, it's taken a little time to find the high grade, but uh, I think we're on to it now and it'll be... Uh, It'll be interesting to see what comes next. Exciting. Yeah, no pressure. There was only a, a whole market of excitement waiting for you to, <laughs> to release the kind of numbers that you did this morning. But thankfully uh, for everyone, you did. Um, and yeah. we'll uh, move on from here. Um, all right. The second company that I would love to introduce is Sassy Resources. Now, I don't know really if I should introduce Sassy or Gander. I will let Mark Scott explain uh, the setup there. Thanks, Gwen. Great to be with you. Uh, my name is Mark Schott. I'm the president and CEO of Sassy Resources, which is a pretty uh, young, up-and-coming and, and fast-growing company. We first listed on the CSE last August under the symbol SASY, and uh, we're also listed in the States on OTCQB under the symbol SSYRF, and in, uh, in Germany and Frankfurt and Stuttgart and on Tradegate under 4E7 is our symbol. We, uh, we started off SASE last year with our flagship Four More project in the SK Camp of the Golden Triangle, where we uh, had some very early success in our first field season on the, the Four More project with the Westmore Discovery Zone, which is an intrusive um, orogenic gold discovery that, uh, that we look forward to getting back to and, and having another field season exploring uh, this coming summer, along with about a dozen other prospects on that property. Uh, but the thing about having a great property in the SK camp, the Golden Triangle, is that you get a pretty short field season to work with. And so we spent the winter looking for year-round project opportunities and started working uh, with Vulcan Minerals uh, in the fall of last year and, and through the winter to uh, first option a number of properties from Vulcan Minerals. And then uh, started working with Sean Ryan and his team in December of last year and, uh, and we've since uh, executed three option agreements with, with Sean to uh, establish actually the largest claim position in Newfoundland with 9,032 claims and some 2,257 square kilometers of ground under option. 
uh, and uh, and we're happy to be here today with some of our neighbors, Lab and and uh, and Exploits, and uh, you know the the sort of senior members of the Newfoundland Gold Rush Marathon, and uh, and more and more so uh, NFG with every news release are uh, creating quite a buzz and. We're happy to be here to talk about uh, the great infrastructure and the, the highly prospective ground that there is really across a very wide swath of the now much more well-known central Newfoundland gold belt. I will definitely be uh, diving into some of the things that you just mentioned, some of the high bars that have been set and a bunch of the and the scale of this opportunity, the excitement. So thanks for prefacing all that stuff. Uh, let's move on to our third company that is Sky Gold. And I would love to ask Aaron McBriarty to run us through that story in three minutes. All right, well, uh, uh, my name is Aaron McBriarty. I'm a geologist with uh, Sky Gold um, Incorporated. Uh, we have property in between Newfound Gold and uh, Exploits, um, uh, north and south, it's about uh, four or five, Maybe, maybe six kilometers. Um, we have drill results uh, that show a 35 uh, meter section of uh, 0.77 grams per ton, uh, up to 7.7 .7 grams per ton in some areas. Um, it's a uh, marine, uh, uh, marine sediment classic um, or marine sediment uh, hosted uh, gold. Uh, Deposit uh, epithermal, I believe, but there's some uh, epizonal uh, um, things that might be um, uh, consolidated with the uh, the Foster uh, Foster Gold Mine uh, Camp in Australia that uh, um, a, uh, a fellow was um, talking about uh, the other day on the, on the top of the gate. But uh, I'm looking forward to talking with uh, these three guys and uh, discussing the. Uh, the um, you know further development of uh, the Queensway uh, uh, deposit types. Fantastic! And last but certainly not least, we have Exploits Gold and Mike Collins to introduce that story. Thanks, Gwen. Um, great to be here today. Uh, Exploits Gold uh, is, is a publicly traded CSE company. Ticker's NFLD. Um, trades on the OTC NFLDF and as well on the uh, Frankfurt trade gate and all the European markets, um, the German markets. Exploits really um, came, came to be out of discussions following the, the fabulous uh, initial results out of Newfound Gold back in December 19, uh, 19, uh, 20, 2019. Um, sitting down with uh, Nick Rodway, Gary Lewis, uh, a local prospector as well, um, we kind of looked at at what the, we, we felt that was a sea of change, those, the intersection, um, but more importantly, the model that they were using um, for their exploration and decided that it was a place we had to be in. And because um, both Nick and, and Gary have worked for years and years in, in that camp, they knew the ground, um, were able to put together very significant uh, packages at Mount Payton and at Jonathan's Pond as a cornerstone. Um, and then we, uh, we managed to pull some additional ground in around those uh, through competitive staking, um, and that was that was really where we started. And then we started. We thought about what this model was, and we realized that you know the structures that we're looking at, and they're looking at at the Keats Zone, Newfounds Keats Zone, um, they go from all the way from Hale in North Carolina, which is a six million ounce deposit, all the way over to Dalradian in um, in uh, Ireland which is also six, six million ounces um, indicated and inferred, I should say. Um, and so the potential really wasn't a closeology. It was structure, rock type, and, and the amount of deformation that you're seeing around those structures, sort of the secondary and tertiary um, targets. Uh, so we stepped back and we looked at the exploit subzone on an island basis, and, and through that, we came up with, um, you know, building a land package through um, additional um, uh, joint ventures and, and uh, purchase agreements with local prospectors as well as, as peer staking plays. Managed to put together a, a very large scale um, land package that um, has, you know, 200 kilometers of these deep seated structures. And that's really where, where we land today with, um, I think, five different targets that are permitted for drill. Drilling this summer, that's 
you know, over 70, 70 drill holes uh, permitted on these five different targets and a number of different targets that we're currently bringing forward to put permits on as well. And one of the key things that we're working on is working with Goldspot to look at the land package as a whole. We've just finished, um, I think our VTEM surveys there. Uh, there's a bit more work around that to get the data. But once we have that, we've got a compilation. We'll look at uh, doing um, AI interrogation of that data set to uh, review the targets that we've chosen and where we are within them, but also looking at the, uh, the package as a whole and seeing what else we're missing. Because it's so large, you just can't go over it. You know, one person looking at, you know, the lines of, of geophysics and each prospect. So we need to have that that uh, technology to to advance it. And that's kind of where we're at. And that's busy summer, looking looking forward to it. And really excited to see today to see Roger Moss's uh, press release and, and expanding the potentially Appleton to the north and demonstrating that it's not just a, you know, a really tight focus on the Keats zone, but um, this is a regional thing and this is exciting, I think, for all of us. Well, that's a good um, segue into the first sort of area of questions that I wanted to explore, which is just how this evolved. I mean, Newfoundland has obviously been sitting there for a long time and hadn't got very much attention from gold explorers um and you know there's there's been scattered small scale th gold things there for years but it wasn't until you know roger and a three years ago and newfound newfound gold in about the same time frame and sean ryan that this attention really started to shift so roger why don't i start with you with this question what changed what 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 was it that changed in the approach to newfoundland and the understanding of the geology sort of maybe a little bit big picture wise that started this all off uh well i don't think i can speak for for newfound or, or, or sean um i know well I, I know what sean was doing they I, as far as i'm aware they were both staking at around the same time in uh, 2016 and i think the first round of of gold or the first serious round of gold exploration was done in the mid 80s early 90s by naranda and a lot of the showings that are now on the queensway project were, were discovered during that time. Uh, we've all seen the videos by the Keats, the Keats family and father and son, uh, incredible stories. Um, so I think after that, after that first round, there was uh, basically nothing much happened. There was still a sporadic uh, exploration over the, over the next say 10, 20 years. And then uh, I think what happened was that Sean had um, decided that Newfoundland was the place to go. He'd done everything that he wanted to do over in the Yukon. He came over here and uh, he staked a whole bunch of claims and he optioned them to uh, a company called Talk Resources. And Talk Resources um, went through there on a much larger claim block than, than Sean has now with, with us and with C2C um, and just did a lot of geochemistry. And that started popping up targets. Now, uh, for some reason, Talk decided that that wasn't uh, enough for them, and they dropped the property, which was our, which was our good luck. And um, I think, I think it was really the like Newfound Gold had also been exploring for the same period of time in that three-year period, and um, but it wasn't really until that intersection announced last January that everybody sort of stood up and, and took attention, paid attention, um, myself included. I think that was that was just the the turning point for the entire central Newfoundland. I mean, if you look at Marathon Gold, it had been plugging away down there for, for years. Um, Sockerman had also been drilling, and uh, but nobody was paying attention to those. those I, I think two years ago, you could have bought, um, you could bought Marathon Gold for like a dollar or less. I don't know where it's at now, but, um, and they have something like 4 million ounces in a resource and a, and a positive feasibility study. So, you know, that didn't do it. So it was it was really just that one intersection that just lit everything up in central Newfoundland. It's funny how these things work, right? Like you say, Marathon was well underway to defining a large, and we now know very economic 
resource, um, but it took this high grade hit. And so it's this, it's strange how, you know, the market's preferences for high grade, which has been very apparent for the last few years, just sort of whatever the market's preferring lines up with what gets discovered and all of a sudden an opportunity blossoms. Mark, I know you at Gander have been really adding to your land position. I mean, you all have to some extent. Do you want to talk about um, how that uh, has played out? Like sort of how the ground has been staked or transacted? Um, what's still available? Is it all gone? Um, how quickly people have moved in? You want to paint a little bit of the picture there? Sure. We started, uh, like I said before, with uh, with Vulcan Minerals and some smaller land packages uh, late last year and into the first part of this year. And when we got to talking with Sean Ryan and, and hearing his uh, sort of unifying theory of Newfoundland geology and, and look more into uh, the work that NFG and, and lab and others have been doing, uh, you know, we started to see these, these properties that had the right structure, kind of structures that we were looking for, the right kind of, uh, of rocks that we were looking for and, and uh, started off with an initial set of, of properties that we uh, we're going to option from Sean. And then the more we got into looking at them, uh, the more we, we felt compelled to expand those to the size that they've, uh, they've become today. So uh, we didn't start out intending to acquire almost 2,300 square kilometers of ground on, uh, on, on the island of Newfoundland. Uh, but that's, that's how it's played out as we've gotten more into the details of looking at, for example, uh, the Mount Payton property, which sits next to Michael's ground uh, along the Mount Payton linear, I think they refer to it as, uh, and right in between, it's an 876 square kilometer block of claims uh, directly between the Keats zone and that Mount Payton linear and the Sokum and Moosehead uh, uh, development on, on the other side of us with some really interesting uh, structures, you know, the, the predominant north, uh, southwest and northeast structures, but a, a large uh, uh, nose fold in there and an east-west structure that uh, that's pretty interesting that runs, appears to run right between Keats and Moosehead, uh, all of which have historic gold anomalies uh, uh, sitting right on top of those structures that we've identified in the regional mag surveys that uh, that the Newfoundland Geological Service has been able to provide. So, uh, you know, the, the, there's been a bit of an evolution over the last six or seven months to our uh, position in Newfoundland. And and we really like the ground we've picked up. It's, uh, you know, the old adage, good rocks, uh, good rocks, good uh, neighbors, uh, uh, good jurisdiction, go for it. So, so that's where we are. As for, uh, you know, whether the, the ground is all taken up, the good ground is all taken up by... I wouldn't want to speak for anybody else or, or diminish anybody else's odds of finding success on the island. Uh, the, the, you know, the structural and geological conditions that have been described by other presenters over the course of this three day event, uh, certainly paint a picture as to how that table has been set for there to be any number of, of potentially economic uh, gold and base metal deposits on the island, uh, which has a long history of, of mining, uh, even if the the emergence of the very high grade uh, gold that we're seeing in in the last uh, little while is is fairly due, so um, you know I, I think you'll continue to see staking and and uh, option agreements. There will be some point at which the the conversation turns to M and A, and and I think the the confluence of you know the developing understanding of the geology in Newfoundland. And, and where the gold market is at globally at the moment and the price of gold is at specifically, uh, you have a, you know, a really fortunate, quite rare confluence of circumstance there that um, that's a pretty exciting opportunity. Absolutely. Um, Aaron, I'll switch over to you here. Um, both Roger and Mark uh talked about how this evolved and uh, mark there was painting a bunch of uh was setting the stage in terms of all these different structures ideas um tactics for trying to chase down mineralization do you want to talk i mean you're all doing a lot of work this summer and you are but four of multiple of, of far more companies who are doing a lot of work this summer so i i think a lot of questions are going to be asked and hopefully answered this summer in terms of 
gold in Newfoundland and maybe base metals as well, but we might as well focus on gold right now. Do you want to help us um, think about what are the main questions that investors might want to try and figure out as data starts to come out from all these programs about Newfoundland, about, you know, is it certain structures that you want to pay attention to? Geologic theories that you think are really important, but don't have answers to. What are you most excited to see out of the data this summer? Because there's going to be lots of it in terms of understanding the opportunity in Newfoundland. Well, um, in my conversations with uh, uh, my senior geologist, uh, Bob uh, Weicker, um, when we discuss assay results uh, in terms of what we have versus what Newfound Gold has, there's always a discussion of, you know, like we can't compare ourselves to Newfound Gold because, you know, like the numbers are incredible and it's a bonanza fine, right? It's, it's, it's absolutely mind blowing. But with, like, in terms of the Keats zone, you have 96 grams per ton over 16 meters or something like that, right? And then, like, let's say that that was a, a once in a lifetime fine, right? That, that'd be a great fine. But then they get 25 grams per ton, two kilometers north of there, and 45 grams per ton, two kilometers north of there. And then today, Roger Moss uh, shows us that uh, he's got 100 grams per ton north of there, right? And who knows? what uh, what's going to come up so what you're looking at is you know high arsenic values you're looking at uh, in this particular place you're looking for high stibnite values you know bugs in the uh, uh quartz vein um you know like uh, are are the veins offshooting from the main fault right uh, is our main vein going through there are you want are you near faults uh, are you near uh, one of these uh like out to fault zones or uh, like the dog bay line fault right uh, these are things that uh, people need to watch out for, right? And we have, um, you know, nothing like Roger's company or uh, Newfound Gold, but uh, in terms of, you know, like over 35 meters, we have 0.77 grams per ton. That would be great in any other market, but not in this market, <laughs> you know? Like, it's like, you know, how do we compete with, with you know, this big monster? Right, that uh, you know hasn't been found in North America in the last thirty years, right? And that's that's what we're looking at. Is that's that's the kind of thing that's going on in January right now. Fair enough. Yeah, the numbers out of Newfound are unreal, and they have certainly set the bar very high in terms of investor expectations. And we'll yeah, like like crazy, crazy, crazy mm -hmm. high. Um, but like you say, they do keep kicking out numbers from zones that are not close to each other. And then Labrador just added to that pile today. So I'm yes. very interested to follow this whole region as you guys all do a bunch of drilling this summer. Now, speaking of all of these companies who are working there um, and this being a true area play, which is exciting as a, as a Canadian gold investor, it's exciting to see an area play. We haven't had like a real area play to sink our teeth into in a while. Um, Area plays are interesting because there's certainly competitive tension. You know, you want to get your ground and you, if you have particular ideas that are a bit proprietary, you might want to hold on to those, keep your cards close to your chest. But at the same time, this is, as I've, we've illuminated in the discussion already, this is an evolving geologic theory, this whole area. So collaboration, I'm sure, is also important. And I know you all follow each other's work pretty closely. So, Mike, do you want to talk a little bit about um, that sort of competitive tension versus collaborative effort and, and how that, I mean, you guys are exploits just started drilling today. So you're sort of at the at the earlier stage relative to Roger and Labrador, for example. Uh, how is that for exploits um, as you get established and move forward? Um, how is it? What is it like working in this area play? It's actually been really great. Um, the uh, starting at the bottom, I guess, the prospectors that we're working with um, have been very forthcoming about the projects that they've vended into our company. But they've also been really um, helpful in terms of talking about what they see in other pieces of ground that we have. Because obviously, they have they have stock, so they want to see the whole thing go, um, whether or not it's you know their piece or some other piece. Um, Stepping up, we've had uh, really good relationships with um, people at, at Newfound. Um, Goldspot, we've obviously um, working with as a consultant to our company. 
uh, they've they've been on the ground with newfound for I guess three years at this point. So that sort of there is not specific information on the newfound projects we're understanding, but the overall understanding of the the district as a whole um, that's really flowed through. Uh, we've talked a little bit with um, uh, both um, Rogers guys on the ground and um, and Aaron's team in uh, in in Gander. Uh, so there's there's a fair bit of sharing of information and, and helping people move forward as a whole. And I think that's great. Um, it's kind of sad when you get these situations in camps where everyone's, you know, just holding everything really tightly. And um, I think it, it uh, the, the openness of it, everybody moves forward together and we all rise, you know, at the same time. Faster we can, time is always our enemy in this business. So... You know, if we can help each other, then we'll all go ahead. And if, if at the end of the day, our project doesn't have what it takes to have a discovery or someone else's doesn't, then we're not getting hurt by sharing information or, you know, so it's it's not a competitive advantage, I don't think, to do that. It's, I think it's sad when people get all um, secretive and squirrely. So great, great to be working in Newfoundland. Well, I would say that that help each other perspective is very Newfoundlander. Um, yeah. My, from my experience visiting that lovely island. Um, Mark, why don't I ask you a bit about um, working in Newfoundland from a community and government and, and geologic survey perspective. I mean, you guys have really just sh showed up in the last few years en masse. Um, I don't know if that's taken the islanders you know, by surprise a little bit, or, you know, there, there, there's the risk of that having a downside. There's also a lot of opportunity for upside there. So what's it like um, on the community and government side um, working in this area play in Newfoundland? We're still pretty new, uh, Sassy and, and our subsidiary Gander Gold are still pretty new to the area, but certainly by all accounts, the, uh, the provincial government has really set the table, right? They've been doing the work for many years when uh, when gold prices were low and there wasn't this level of enthusiasm for uh, for exploration there wasn't the funding available to to create the conditions for this kind of an area play to oh uh, so the government knew about all this before you guys did that's what you're well, saying well they they have been they have been working on it right a lot of those those uh, the 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 maps of uh, lake seds and till samples over the years uh, you know they've done an excellent job of of putting all of that information together and making it available and and, and creating the, the conditions that uh, I can tell you, having worked from one end of this country to the other, I wish more jurisdictions would do a better job of. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, understand that, that economic development and wealth creation are not accidents. They, they happen by design. They happen because the structures exist to enable uh, those events. And, and so I think the government of Newfoundland and Labrador have done a great job of, uh, of creating those conditions. And, uh, you know, the likes of, of Eric Sprott, who are making sure to uh, inject some funding uh, in this environment into the juniors that are the incubator for the industry, uh, you know, is, is again, is, is creating that opportunity. And then, you know, the infrastructure on the island, they have uh, uh, relatively inexpensive, abundant, uh, hydro-generated, low-carbon sourced uh, electricity roads throughout the island, uh, primary highways and, and secondary uh, access roads uh, the, that cover the island, right? It's not all, it's not all helicopter access only. Uh, uh, there's actually very good infrastructure, lots of water, uh, an experienced workforce who uh, either, either at home or, or having uh, commuted for the last several decades uh, to, you know, Thompson and Flin Flon and Fort Mac and and everywhere else in the country that uh, that I've been and lived over the years, uh, you know the, the the population here knows this industry. They they know hard work and uh, and they have a lot of experience and, and enthusiasm for it to bring to bear on on this uh, on these developments. So you know between the jurisdiction, the uh, uh, the the people, the experience, the workforce, uh, there it's got everything going for it as a as a jurisdiction and uh, you know at some point there will be a supply crunch which will sort itself out right the supply will arise to to meet the demand either uh, either at home or or from away right and uh, I've actually have spoken to, to multiple 
Diamond Drilling and other exploration service companies, for example, that are that are owned and, and operated by Newfoundlanders who uh, who've been working in northern Ontario and northern Manitoba, who are actually packing up and getting ready to go home. And and I can tell you that uh, as a New Brunswicker who's lived everywhere but since the age of sixteen, it's it's nice to be able to uh, you know think about working a whole lot closer to home. And so I I think that will have uh, uh, a lot of attractiveness for the people who. Uh, who've been able to live there and those who've had to uh, live away for all kinds of good reasons over the years. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, it does sound like a, a pretty solid setup, match made in heaven type thing uh, for a bunch of the reasons you just painted. Aaron, um, let me ask you a bit about um, honing in on targets and then hopefully, you know, hitting into the discoveries that you're looking for. Um, quite a few of, of the, the, the companies here have pretty big land packages, pretty new land packages, lots of uh, things that look interesting uh, on those land packages. Um, and so now you're starting the work of figuring out where the good hits might be within those big land packages. But you're doing that uh, for better or worse in the context of very high investor expectations, right? Because of the successes that have already taken place. Um, so you want to talk a bit about the process um, and maybe like the process of, of targeting. And, and I know that's a bit of a nebulous question without being so specific to your own projects, but the process of targeting and sort of the approach um, that companies have to take in that. And maybe in the context of setting investor expectations, like we can't expect that every whole that the first drill program of every hole is going to return 100 grams gold. Well, uh, you know, you start off with uh, uh, your geochem or your your prospecting is going on, and then you you uh, either option it off, and you find investors and stuff like that. But uh, eventually, you get to a drill program that uh, you have soil samples, you have hand samples in the area, uh, you've got enough sampling that you you've got an idea of what's underneath the ground and you have historical um uh, uh information on previous drilling or uh, something like that that uh, you can go on so you create a model of uh, theoretically what's underneath the ground right and then you need to pick out your drill targets as to you know the highest amount of gold that you're going to get and uh you need to pick that target as to one what uh you know what your host rock is going to be with what the um uh you know the highest probability of uh getting quartz veins in terms of uh gold exploration um and you if it's a it's kind of like shooting fish in the ocean a lot of times you don't know if you're going to hit it but um you know you make your best guess you know like uh 75 to 85 percent um you know right and uh, a lot of times you swing and you miss, and sometimes you hit it out of the park. And um, we hit uh, a lot of dusters, right? Yeah. But we hit a couple of really good ones. Yeah. Right? So, but that's the name of the game, right? Like, uh, you know, um, if if they were all going to be good, you know, what's the, what's the point in uh, doing it? Because it'd be boring. Right? <laughs> and gold be worth nothing. <laughs> that that so, is very true. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, you know, basically, you need as much information as you can possibly get uh, uh, on, a, on a on a on a play, and then you can start putting holes in the ground. and And the more holes you put in the ground, the better your chances of hitting stuff because you got the um, the information to to target stuff, right? And from what so, Mark was saying, the geologic survey has a good starting point for that sort of information. And then, do you want to just add in just for some context? What sort of geophysics uh, appears to be helpful um, so for the investors listening um, in this district? Because, you know, geophysics to a lot of investors is just colorful blobs and lines on a map. So maybe some uh, reference around, around that in this area. Well, we did a magnetic survey, which gave us a lot of information. Um, uh, resistivity survey uh, might work with, um, just as good. But uh, with the graphite in our particular area, it uh, uh, like the magnetics, uh, it, it defines a graphite area, which is what where we don't want to drill, right? So everything else is more of a target, right? But um, you know, like different magnetic surveys give you different different results, right? But um, I think uh, 
What would they run? Was it a magnetic survey on a uh, newfound gold? I believe it was. For structure, someone I think uh, uh, help, uh, someone help me out with that? Magnetics and EM, I think. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. But uh, you know, generally, like like everything will give you different information as to like uh, you know uh, quartz veining or uh, you know uh, graphite anomalies or something like that, right? For sure. Um, I'm going to get to uh, some questions that are coming in from the audience in just a moment. But first, I'm going to ask Mike one more question, which is you you um, pointed to this in your little in your introduction, um, which was about using AI to help you in the type of process that I just had Aaron describe, which is going from a huge land package with a bunch of things that look interesting based on a, a, a list of different data packages. Um, yeah. Do you wanna describe, there, this is partly from a question that came in as well, the AI system, like someone asks, are you using the same AI program that Great Bear used? Um, that's not, I mean, that you can answer that question, absolutely. But do you wanna talk about AI a little bit more deeply and what it is, how it works, and how you're hoping that it will help exploits. Yeah, okay, I'm happy to happy to do that. The um, I guess there are a number of people out there who who um, specialize in the AI interrogation of geological data sets. Uh, really, what we what we've done is we've compiled all of the um, the various assessment reports and geological data that we have, the mapping that the government has done. The so the regional um, soil and tills and um, and lake sediments, then we add into that uh, the work that we've done in the last year, and on top of that all, we're basically taking the airborne survey that we've flown, which is VTEM, um, uh, which is an EM survey, and adding in magnetics with it as well, and you look at the relationships between those things and looking to identify a the deep-seated structures um, also and and looking to identify the demagnetized zones which indicate that you've got a higher uh, hydrothermal fluid flow through the rocks the warmer water you know uh, basically uh, converts magnetite into hematite and other things like that so you've got destruction of magnetite and, and that identifies so you, you look for your structure and then you say, well, has anything gone through it or is it just a tight fault? Because faults can be conduits for fluids or they can be uh, barriers to fluids. So you've got to be able to differentiate the two. And then you're looking for um, intersections of these structures uh, with those things. And you can do that line by line going through, uh, compiling all that into a GIS system and looking at the lines of information that you have from your airborne survey, and then looking at all that other information underneath it. But to do that line by line would take us years. Whereas AI can do that sort of in, in a few days. And then we've got highlighted targets and we have experienced geophysicists and geologists who go through that data set and rank those targets and and you know pick the ones that we think need to be followed up and we don't. There are there are, as I said, a number of different public companies um, and private groups. Some people have internal uh, strategy, AI strategies. Um, so you can go a lot of different directions with this. Um, I guess for us, uh, going with Goldspot was a bit of a no-brainer because they have already demonstrated their ability to uh, make discoveries in the camp, and they've kind of tuned their, their artificial intelligence program to the camp. Um, and it's not really, you can't just say, okay, well, I've, I've worked out how this works with Great Bear. Now I'm going to go look at stuff in the Western Pilbara in Australia and, and, and get the same results. It's got, you've got to, you know, it's garbage in, garbage out with computers. So you've got to have the, the data set, but you have to have a real thought of what you're looking for in your AI. So it's got to be driven by knowledgeable people. Um, yeah, but with with you know huge land package over two thousand square kilometers of ground, we just couldn't cover it. So this is a very effective way of moving targets forward and and being able to hit them with the drill quickly. And time time is is money, and you know investors lose patience very quickly. So we've got to be able to drive discovery as quickly as possible. So. Absolutely. Roger, I haven't been ignoring you in this conversation. I know I only asked you one question at the beginning, but that's partly because a bunch of the questions that have been coming in from the audience are about your drill hit. So I'm going to dive into that for a few moments. Everyone else can just go get a coffee or something. Um, 
so, I mean, I'll, I'll compile some of these questions, but does, I mean, great news today. Does what you intersected today change your drilling plan um, there? Um, uh, your drilling plan at the main vein does it does it change how you're approaching that or um, is it uh, continue on the on the path? Uh, we have a drilling strategy in place, um, and but but it is uh, it is one that is evolving. Um, to say that we're just going to drill these holes and drill them regardless of what the results are, I don't think is is uh, something that any any piece of geologist would do. Um, so whenever we get results. We analyze those results and we adapt uh, our drill plan accordingly. Um, and we, could, we, we do that on the fly. As everybody's aware, the, the turnaround times at the labs are on the order of, I don't know what they are now, five, six weeks, I think, um, for, regular, for regular samples. Um, but we do use uh, portable XRF in the core shack um, on, every, on every hole. And it's really that that allows us to to uh, tinker or, or really just tweak tweak the drill program um, as to what we're seeing in the portable XRF. And it's basically, as Aaron alluded to earlier, it's arsenic and antimony is what we're looking at. And where we see arsenic and antimony starting to pick up, that's that's where we know we're onto something. And um, we've seen. We've seen um, antimony minerals in the core. We've seen arsenopyrite in the core. So um, those are things that we use to, uh, yeah, to tweak, to tweak our, our strategy. Expanding on that, I mean, that obviously makes great sense. Expanding on that question a bit, there's a there's several people who have been asking about, um, you know, continuing with scout holes a long strike versus now trying to go deeper or trying to understand plunge of higher grades um, based on, I mean, obviously you basically have one key data point now. Um, so yeah, what's your response to that? If someone's asking you, uh, are you going to start doing some deeper drilling to understand plunge um, of higher grade shoots? Absolutely. I mean, I think, uh, you know, we've, we've intersected the visible gold in four drill holes. We've, um, we've had results back from two. Um, and uh, we're we're targeting that that ore shoot. Um, that's that's our key right now. And uh, you know, I, I think I think we have to we have to hit it hard until we understand how that thing is plunging, and we don't understand that yet. Mm -hmm. So we we have we have some ideas, but the geology is really complex. Um, folding, faulting, um, it's. Uh, it's well, which, which is a, a good thing because that's why that's why the gold's there. It yeah. comes along these structures and it gets trapped by by fold noses and things like that. So um, it's good to have complex structure, but um, you know, on, on the other hand, it's 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 a bit of a it's a bit of a challenge for the for the geos and um, who I must say are doing an incredible job. They're just they're just doing a great job of teasing teasing out the structure. And then, of course, you're in that um, the, the battle that always presents when you get into a nice high grade hit in a vein type structure, which is how far do you step, right? You want to take big steps to see how big this thing is versus taking small steps that um, you have a bit more confidence in. And the market, I'm sure, wants you to do both and everything all at the same time. <laughs> of course they do. <laughs> um, no, we're, we're, really, we're really following the, uh, the strategy that we found gold has been so successful with baby steps basically um that their last hole which was phenomenal was that the, i think it was 60 60 meter step out down plunge and uh they hit the best the best hole that they had i'd love to do that but um you can only do that when you're confident in where things are going and you know as, as i just said we're, we're not there yet we will we will be stepping out i mean we've got a you know, the big vein itself, a its surface is 400 meters. We've drilled about 80 meters a long strike with that. And then after that, we have another 12 kilometers, the Appleton Fault, um, which Just is 12 kilometers. showing up in different places. Things are popping up. So, yeah, we're going to be stepping out big time. But right now, the focus is uh, nailing that hydrate. Gotcha. Um, 
Okay, I'm going to move on to another few questions specific to companies. Mike, um, someone was asking, are you drilling? I, I think the fun answer is that you just started like today. But do you want to talk about your first, second and third targets um, in this nascent drill program? Yeah, so so our we are drilling and very excited to be doing that. That's, um, of course, a, a sea of change in, in our in what we're doing. Uh, we're drilling at Schooner, which is about three and a half kilometers to the west of the Keats zone on a parallel structure um, called the Schooner Fall. Um, we started last Thursday, I think we started turning a drill. So things are progressing there quite nicely. The usual um, uh, hiccups with getting getting things going consistently, but we're pretty excited. We've got our office open now in Gander and our core shack there waiting for, uh, well, actually, I think there might be some boxes in there now. Um, so that's, yeah, it's all very exciting. We are uh, beyond Schooner, which is basically, it's, it's uh, a structure that's parallel to the Appleton off to the west. Um, looks very much like geophysical uh, uh, target that, that exists at Keats. Um, we're looking at fault splays there and secondary and, and tertiary structures coming off of, of the Schooner fault itself. So looking for areas where um, we can see golds coming up through the system, but has enough room in these secondary tertiary or splays to to be able to bloom and create a significant amount of gold and uh, in a deposit. And that's sort of that's a really our target there. Uh, I think our next drill program will probably be up at the Quinlan veins in the north. Uh, we've got some really nice VG and outcrop there. Uh, a number of samples, I think, ranging from 64 to uh, the 20s, 20 um, uh, grams per ton gold um, in outcrop, and uh, that's that's we're really excited about that. It's um, a wide zone of, of quartz veining on a secondary structure coming off of the Appleton, which is really the model that we've got to look for, and um, we think we can extend that fault on strike um, or that, those vein structures quite a distance. Uh, we think that's that's a super opportunity. We also see a um, we think is a tertiary structure and geophysics coming off of that. So this is the structural complexity that you really need to build a, build a lot of ounces, potentially build a lot of ounces. Um, past that, it's kind of a toss up between Little Joanna where we've got our best grade and outcrop to I think 194 grams gold um, or Jonathan's Pond. Um, Jonathan's Pond, uh, we've got to, we want to do a little bit more work on to, to really um, clean up our targeting there before we start pushing holes into that. But that's, um, you know, that's a really exciting large scale target um, and a little bit different. Um, Mark Scott uh, and, and I with SASE were, were focused there on the grub line, which is a bit of a different rock type. But again, deep seated structures, we know there's gold coming up. We've got 28 grams visible gold and in, in outcrop there. Um, so we know that the system is gold bearing. It's just identifying these structures and, and, and getting um, keying in on these the the areas of, of significant deformation where you can form these deposits. So, all right, that's a good context layout from exploits. Aaron, do you want to? I know you have results that are coming in in the next little while, um, and then you're you know kicking off and summer work programs as well. Do you want to um, lay out the scene of where you you know? The, the targets that you have been testing, what your what your plans are for the summer, just so that those who are interested um, know what to look for in news from Sky. Well, we just had a um, uh, a nineteen hole drill program over the, uh, over the winter that's just taken a long time for the assays to come back. So uh, we're you know over the next couple of weeks, uh, potentially we're going to have all those results. Uh, uh, put out and, uh, and press released. Uh, as far as it goes over the summer, um, uh, we're looking at uh, uh, maybe August or September uh, for a start date for a, a new drill program on Mustang. Uh, and we're going to do uh, uh, another uh, uh, soil sampling program, uh, geochemistry or hand, hand sampling and potentially uh, drilling on the uh, Virginia property, which is right underneath uh, uh, Rogers property. Um, so there's some exciting stuff coming up. 
Uh, Mark, I'm going to give you sort of the same opportunity. Gander, I mean, you're sort of just finishing. I don't even know if you are finished pulling together land, but that's certainly what the focus has been. But now you have a bunch of cash, a bunch of it from Eric, who has been an important funding mechanism for this area play for the gold ex exploration industry worldwide, but specifically for Newfoundland these days. So you have land and you have cash. What's the summer plan for Gander? Uh, we have engaged uh, Sean Ryan and Kathy Wood and, and Ground Truth Exploration to basically run our program for the summer uh, that uh, lets us hit the ground running without having to spend a lot of time and money uh, starting up and getting our own infrastructure in place. They have a a 30 person crew already working in the area and in fact uh, started till sampling just this morning I believe uh, uh, on our Gander North uh, project just right next door to Michael's uh, Jonathan's Pond uh, target so uh, so we've started the program there we think we'll spend uh, sort of in this phase one early exploration program this year about three and a half million dollars uh, we're going to be flying uh, fixed wing uh, uh, mag survey over all 2257 square kilometers uh, uh, as soon as possible starting in a few weeks time we're going to do the same with lidar uh, we're collecting all of the uh, the aerial photography and things such that we need to uh, sort of do the desktop prospecting and then uh, we will have the ground truth crews uh, doing their uh, their soil and till sampling program across the priority structures that we've identified on on all of our uh, project areas uh, on the island. So that'll be followed up with some probing and uh, exploratory uh, rab drilling and then diamond drilling uh, for most of the project areas, the exception being the Gander North project, the, the portion of it uh, in that Jonathan's Pond area where we, where we, uh, we optioned a, a block of claims from Vulcan Minerals and have a drill permit in place, we, uh, Based on the the results of this early till sampling that we've we've started and uh, uh, and the follow up in that we expect to be doing some exploratory orientation diamond drilling in that area this summer, uh, maybe as maybe as much as fifteen hundred meters. So not a large program, but that'll get us started drilling on the island. And then, of course, uh, sort of corporately, I'd, I'd be re remiss if I didn't mention over on the left coast we're flying a VTEM survey over the one hundred and forty six square kilometer four more property at the moment and we'll be be drilling there following up on the Westmore uh, discovery zone uh, from last summer uh, next month so lots lots on the go on on either side of the country for sure okay now here's my last question and you're each going to have to answer it and it's a bit of a tricky one which is outside of projects that land targets that your companies own so roger can't choose and choose anything that labrador owns michael can't choose anything that exploit exploits owns what is your favorite target um exploration target on the island i mean this is just a a, a wealth of knowledge of, of who's got what and who's doing what um in newfoundland so i'm taking advantage of it to ask each of you which target outside of your own are you watching for results from this summer um, with interest? Roger, how would I pick on you first? Uh, gold. Okay. <laughs> are you are you going to eliminate that as an option? As I, I feel like I should maybe eliminate Newfound because I mean they're already worth eight hundred million dollars or whatever. Uh, Roger, you, probably, you probably should. Um, you know what? I, it, it's it's probably an unfair question in some ways because. Uh, some companies are further along than others and we don't really know what what uh, the ground the ground has yet so um i go for structure um i know that uh i i know that exploits has done quite a bit bit of work up around jonathan's pond i was following that quite closely and um uh i don't think mike you've had anything out from it recently but uh I'll, i'm gonna be very interested to see when you get a drill on it because um, that looks to me that looks really good it's it, it's it's on the structure it's um you've got high grade at surface um so yeah i think that's one i will be watching and fair enough that absolutely there's targets of all stages across newfoundland right now some of them very early i mean mark's talking about how they're just starting soil sampling so obviously mark's targets are very early but that's the nature of the game right we always have targets across a wide range of stages so just right i'm just asking the question based on what's available right now mike what uh what target areas maybe would you wish that exploits could have gotten when you were establishing your land package or what are you watching outside of your ground who's who's the bell of the ball 
Um, I guess I would I would say in a sweeping statement that I, I actually really like all the uh, the projects that my my co-presenters have um, here today. I think these are great. But um, if I'm looking for an outlier that that's that's not on on uh, on the screen today, I'd probably pick Canstar uh, down to the south. Okay. Um, they've got uh, grubline targets, and we actually I think we did talk with the uh, the vendors on a couple of those pieces of ground early on. Um, uh, and, and it's very much a grub line uh, target, uh, which which we believe in and we think is sort of the sleeper in the camp. Um, and that's uh, that's yeah, that would be one of the things I think that people should look at. Cool, Aaron, what are you looking for? I'm just gonna hop outside the Queen's Way and uh, say the Beer Peninsula. It's a really interesting place, and uh, it's got a lot of potentially. Uh, potential gold finds in it uh, that, that I don't think many people have looked at. And which company? And, uh, I think uh, Pope Palm Resources uh, is a company. Uh, they got okay. an operation down there right now. But uh, it's something to look at. Interesting. Okay. Outside ideas. I like it. Mark, what about you? Well, again, I. I wouldn't want to dismiss anybody's odds of uh, of making a discovery. The, the prospectivity of this ground, from the long range fault in the in the west to the Hermitage uh, system and the and the grub line, and even outboard of that to the east, uh, all through central Newfoundland, is uh, is a is a highly prospective, very exciting piece of ground. And and you know all the presenters today and. And all who've uh, who've been on here the last three days have uh, have some really interesting properties. Um, you know, if I had to choose some, I, I'd choose some of my neighbors, I guess, selfishly. Uh, Jonathan's Pond that uh, and uh, and the Mount Peyton Linear that Exploits have, and an Eastern Pond that uh, that NFG has very close to our uh, Gander South property, and. Uh, Moosehead across the way from from Mount Peyton and Matador, which were uh, sidled right up to uh, down on the Cape Ray Fault in a in a different down towards Port Basque in a different part of the province. So, uh, you know, there there are going to be multiple discoveries here. Uh, some companies are further along, but you know the the four million soon to be five, I'm sure, million ounce deposit at Marathon and what NFG is doing and what Matador has that they're going to turn into a million plus ounce deposit and bring into production exploits and lab are a little further along and and then uh you know a whole group of juniors sassy and, and gander and sky gold included uh are uh, are going to take advantage of this building uh knowledge about the geology of the island and and i think we're going to see multiple handfuls of really significant economic discoveries over the the coming months and and the next several years well that's a positive note to end on. Not that there's been much in the way of negative in this conversation, but that's a nice positive note to end on. One question came in just at the end here, and I'm just going to take a quick stab at answering it. It's a hard one to answer. For the new, um, what should we as investors be looking for in both the long and short term to gauge the likelihood of high grade fines from different companies out there? I mean, my answer to that, because I get that sort of question all the time from subscribers, is first of all, understand what the company is trying to do. If they can explain it well, it shouldn't matter whether you're a geologist or not, they need to be able to explain what they're doing, why they're doing it, and why they think it's going to work. And if it does work, what that might mean. So what the results would look like if it works. If you can understand the story and therefore have some understanding of the results when they come out, that means that they have a clear plan, they're executing on that plan, and that is the, the most important starting point. It's amazing actually how often that's missing in exploration companies, a very clear plan, um, but that's the, that's the starting point. And then as we sort of touched on in this conversation, this is a new area. There's a huge number of targets being tested. So it's also helpful if a company is testing multiple different targets. As Aaron mentioned at one point there, you know, we turn up a lot of dusters in this industry because we're trying to find things that are literally hidden under the ground. And so you do all the best groundwork that you can, and then you drill to see what's actually down there. If a company is drilling more than one promising looking target, that's just more kicks at the can. The odds of success are higher if they have more than one target that they're testing as a first phase approach. So that's my quick answer to that question because I just don't really have time to turn it over to the guys again. Thank you, Mark, Roger, Aaron, and Michael for joining us today on this panel. And now I'm going to turn it over um, to a talk that we are all, uh, those of us on the panel are interested to um, listen into. 
which yep. is Richard Goldfarb. So he is a director of C2C Gold. Um, he's also a geologist, uh, very familiar with Newfoundland um, terrain and uh, how the Newfoundland gold exploration picture is evolving. And he has a talk for us now on precisely that topic. So uh, without further ado, we will move into that. I would, I will mention that this is the last day of um, the Virtual Investor Day Summit. So if you want to keep up to date with all things Newfoundland, then sign up to receive the newsletter at newfoundland.gold. We were chatting before this started that you can get .gold as a website. I don't know why every exploration company in the world doesn't have .gold as a website, but the Newfoundland team figured it out. So go to newfoundland.gold. You can sign up for the newsletter and it will help you keep abreast of everything that's happening in this exciting area play. Thank you so much for tuning in um, and enjoy Richard's talk on geology. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Gwen. Thanks, Gwen. Thanks, guys.